In his sermon, Learning in Wartime, C.S. Lewis doubles down on the teaching of heaven and hell. He said, but to a Christian, the true tragedy of Nero must not be that he fiddled while the city was on fire, but that he fiddled on the brink of hell. So true. I mean, the great and true tragedy of this world, not just for the Neros of this world, is how people and our leaders continue to fiddle on the brink of hell, thinking nothing about our profound rebellion and no accountability to God. It's in this context that the original Emmanuel prophecy was given 700 years before Christ, hell was breaking loose in Jerusalem. Wicked King Ahaz fiddled while Jerusalem was burning. And instead of turning to God, he doubled down in his wickedness. He made an alliance, not with the Lord, but with the king of Assyria. And King Ahaz emptied the palace, emptied the temple of its treasures to pay Assyria tribute. A pagan nation with pagan gods. He sold the nation out to a foreign power and he led Judah into pagan worship. The Davidic promise, the Davidic throne was nearly wiped out. When the situation was so dark, distressful, and full of anguish, God prophesied that a light, a joy, a heavenly child would be born, Emmanuel, to transform, transform all this gloom to glory. And that's what we, read, what we read in Isaiah chapter 9. Let's look at Isaiah 9 verse 6. For a child will be born to us, a son will be given to us, and the government will rest on his shoulders and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. So this Emmanuel prophecy goes from Isaiah 7 to Isaiah 12. I think it has a past present and future fulfillment in the past 700 years before Christ it seems to me that son that was given was King Hezekiah the son of Ahaz who reversed all the policies of that wicked King Ahaz and what Hezekiah did was nothing short of miraculous because he turned the nation back to the Lord and the Lord won a miraculous victory for Judah the Davidic line was saved, and that means Christmas was saved. <laughs> and that takes us on to an even greater fulfillment in the birth of Christ. We read in Luke 1, verse 30, And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and give birth to a son, and you shall call, yeah, and you shall name him Jesus, and he will be great. And will be called Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom will have no end. So the Emmanuel child prophesied would be Jesus, the child, the son, virgin born. Jesus is the greater fulfillment of the Emmanuel prophecy. God with us, the Son of God with us. But, let me ask a question. What about this forever reign? Is he just reigning in heaven? Over the world, through the church? Or is there something more to this kingdom that will have no end? I think this points us to a future period when the Emmanuel prophecy will be fulfilled again in the future in a way we have not yet seen. So let's go back to Isaiah 9. Isaiah 9, verse 7. It says, There will be no end to the increase of his government or of peace on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and uphold it with justice and righteousness from then on and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of armies will accomplish this. So this is going to happen. The zeal of the Lord 
guarantees this future fulfillment of the Emmanuel prophecy. The world has yet to see anything like this, a government of peace. When does that happen? A forever kingdom of justice and righteousness. Have you seen that? Usually when a government gets bigger, it gets more corrupt. But this government of Emmanuel future will grow and increase and become even more peaceful, more righteous, more just. We've never experienced anything like this. Imagine how great this will be. A kingdom like this would be an answer to the prayer, an answer to the prayer Jesus taught us to pray in Matthew 6. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So the ultimate fulfillment of this Emmanuel prophecy will be in this future kingdom when God's will is done on earth just as it is in heaven. How cool is that? How does the Bible speak of this future kingdom? I think this future kingdom is what we call the millennium. It means a thousand-year rule of Christ on earth. So here's how I think the future will play out. In the grand scheme of things, these are the big pieces. You have the church age. Christ came. He lived. He died as the Lamb of God to take away our sin. He, he rose. And that instituted the church and we're in the church age right now and at the end of the church age there will be this prophecy of Daniel of 70 weeks seven years of the time of an antichrist the time of tribulation to finish that church age and to put an end to that time Jesus will return this time he comes as the lion of Judah he comes as king and what does a king do he sets up a kingdom and that's what I think will happen after Christ returns at his second advent. He will set up an earthly millennium, a thousand year period on the earth. And then when that time is completed, we usher in the new heaven and the new earth. Now, if you were raised Catholic, Lutheran, Presbyterian, Reformed, you probably take out two pieces. You take out the seven years, take out the earthly millennium, they teach that there's the church age, Christ comes, judgment, new heavens, new earth. I'm fine with that. I just think this is way more interesting. And I think it's closer to a natural reading of Scripture. This is called the premillennial view that Christ comes before there is a millennium on the earth. So let's see what we can find out from the book of Isaiah about this future millennium. But let me first say the early church fathers had this pre-millennial view of the end times. Justin Martyr was born a hundred years after Jesus. He's one of the first Christian apologists. He said this, but I and others who are right-minded Christians on all points are assured there will be a resurrection of the dead. There was some debate whether or not there would be a resurrection of the dead. He was assured there would be a resurrection of the dead. And immediately after that, what happens? And a thousand years in Jerusalem, which will then be built, adorned, enlarged, as the prophets Ezekiel and Isaiah and others declare, Justin Martyr. So what does Justin, the prophet Isaiah, and many other theologians say about this thousand year rule of Christ on the earth. This is what I want to answer in the time left. What will Emmanuel and his earthly millennium be like? First, Christ will reign on David's throne. We read that in Isaiah 9 7. That means Jesus will rule on the earth from Jerusalem. And this fulfills the Davidic covenant in 2 Samuel 7, where God promised King David a thousand years before Christ that his descendant would have a forever throne and kingdom. Jesus is David's descendant. 
Second, Christ will govern the whole world. We read that in Isaiah 9, 6. The government will rest on Emmanuel's shoulders. Zechariah 14, 9 repeats the same promise of Isaiah 9. It says, and the Lord will be king over all the earth. On that day, the Lord will be the only one in his name, the only one. So one king will rule the whole world, Jesus, in the millennial kingdom. Third, the nations will come and honor Christ. We see that in Isaiah 11. Isaiah 11 describes the massive, impressive, pious, and skillful rule of Christ the King. The nations will be amazed. They will go to him. They will flock to him for advice, for knowledge. They will rally to Christ, Isaiah 10, Isaiah 11, 10. The nations will rally to Christ for the land where he lives will be glorious. The nations, the leaders of nations will all be jealous of what's happening, what the king has built in this world. And the kingdom will bring an end to all hostility between the nations, between classes and between races. There will be a universal respect and submission to Christ and his lordship. For the nations will learn from the Lord. We see that in chapter 2, verse 3 of Isaiah. It describes how people will long, they will come to seek to be taught from the Lord and how to walk in his paths. Isaiah 11, 9 says, The earth will be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. There will be learning in all the schools like never before. Loving in all the homes, growing to the fullness of maturity for every man woman and child. Truth will flood the courts, the government, the streets, the media, and even social media. Hallelujah! And the only thing canceled will be lies, deception, ignorance, and foolishness. Five, the nations will never again war. We see that in Isaiah 2.4. Christ will judge between the nations. War isn't going to solve that. Jesus will solve disputes. War will not be necessary. Nations will beat their swords, their spears, into plows and pruning knives. Never again will they learn war. Hallelujah. Soldiers will be redeployed as farmers and gardeners. Six, evil and demonic actors will be confined. We see this in Isaiah 24, 11. The Lord will punish demonic angels, demonic spirits, and evil rulers. Wherever evil is found, it will be confined, punished, and imprisoned. In the millennial kingdom, there will be no Nero fiddling while the city burns down. Isaiah 24 sounds a lot like Revelation 20. It says that in the millennium, Satan will be bound and thrown into a bottomless pit for a thousand years. Now, that means he cannot deceive the nations anymore. Just imagine how different this world will be when there's light shining everywhere. There's no dark, deceptive, demonic activity. Can you believe it? This is the kind of doctrine you want to be true. In seven, paradise will be restored on earth. We read in Isaiah eleven six, it describes the wolf and the lamb, the leopard and the goat, the calf and the lion. I think the bear and the cow. I mean, it just keeps going on. All these animals that aren't supposed to be together, they're going to be buddies. They're going to be laying down together and the children will have a new friend. They'll be playing with snakes, cobras, and it'll be such a great time. There will be no hurt, no injury, no harm in the millennial kingdom to come. The glory of God will cover the dry lands of this earth like the waters cover the sea when Christ reigns with his resurrected followers in the millennium. And Isaiah 65 speaks of restored health. People will live longer than trees. Work will be fun. 
Labor will be rewarded and fruitful and people will be blessed like no other time in history. And what about us? What about the church? Revelation 20 says that believers will be priests of God and Christ and will reign with him. Will reign with him for a thousand years. I think this is what's referred to in Revelation 5, 9 and 10. Revelation 5, 9 and 10. You were slaughtered, referring to Christ, and you purchased people for God with your blood from every tribe, language, and people, and nation. Verse 10, you have made them, that's the church, into a kingdom and priests to our God, and they will reign upon the earth. Jesus promised the same to his disciples in Matthew 19. In the new world, Jesus said, when the Son of Man will sit on his glorious throne, you who have followed me will also sit on 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. Now you might be thinking, this sounds too good to be true. This stretches the imagination. In this world, right now, we can only imagine just little spurts of love and joy and peace here and there. Fairness and justice, yeah, it shows up here and there, but it seems so temporary. But when this Emmanuel prophecy is finally fulfilled, he will rule the world with truth and grace. Don't we sing that this time of year? The world will be in the full bloom of his glory. It will be a thousand year party with Jesus in a restored planet called Earth. Don't you want to see that? And so why is this millennium teaching so important? Norm Geisler said the millennium is not the first chapter of heaven, but the last chapter of Earth not the completed victory, but the last chapter in the ultimate victory. He must reign, 1 Corinthians 15, 25 says, he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. And then it goes on to say, when every enemy is put under the feet of Christ, Christ will hand the kingdom to his Father. And history, human history, has reached its climax, its purpose to give all the glory to God. And that's how history will end. History will reach its final goal. Goal, Because there's a millennium, Christ and his people win the final chapter of human history. We haven't been winners, have we? The church, Christ, his people, Israel, we've been kicked around, knocked around, we've been unfaithful, it's an ugly story when you think about it. But in the end, Christ and his people will win. The millennium, I think, will be a little bit like the Vikings-Colts game yesterday. As I was watching and as I turned the TV off because there was nothing to see. And then I noticed something was turning around. So I went back to the TV and watched to the end. Do you know that was the millennial game? That was the 1,000th thousand, game of the Vikings. That was the millennial game. They were doomed in the first half, 33-0. Then the second half, oh my, overtime, oh boy, 39 points. It was the greatest come from behind victory in the NFL. The millennium will be the greatest come behind victory in human history. So many people think the church is lost. What a bunch of losers, those people, those Christians. In the millennium, Jesus is going to run up the score, baby. It's going to be Jesus, millions, evil, nothing, zero. Total defeat by King Jesus. And we get to see it happen on earth. Like I said, I really want this to be true. <laughs>
John Eldridge wrote in the book, All things new, heaven, earth, and the restoration of everything you love. The secret to your unhappiness and the answer to the agony of the earth are one and the same. We are longing for the kingdom of God. We are aching for the restoration of all things. So let me summarize Emmanuel's earthly millennium. It will be a time where Christ rules with his saints on the earth, apart from Satan and his influence. It will be a time of rich blessing on people and creation. The earth will be full of peace, righteousness, justice, and the knowledge of the Lord. The nations will come to Jerusalem to worship Christ and hear his instructions. And at the end of this millennium, Satan will be loosed to tempt the nations one final time. There will be a rebellion against Christ and his saints, demonstrating that the evilness in the human heart is still there. But Christ will judge swiftly, throw Satan into the lake of fire, that's hell, and soon after usher in the new heaven and the new earth and that eternal state. Jim Hamilton wrote in his book on Revelation, I close with this, If you are a believer in Jesus, the millennium is describing your future. Satan has gone from the scene. Christ is reigning on earth. You will be raised from the dead to sin no more. No satanic deception, no satanic temptation. In the presence of Christ... You will do justice and serve as a priest to God. This is what you were made to do. You were created to enjoy God as king in God's land, free in free obedience to God's law, uncontaminated, undefiled, unsullied, no devil prowling around like a roaring lion, just freedom, joy, righteousness, in the glad enjoyment of God's presence. Paradise lost will be paradise restored. Can you believe God is going to let us in on this? Let's pray. O come, O come, Emmanuel, past, present, and future. Thank you, God, that you're not done with us. You're not done being with us. You're not done with your work in the church. You're not done with your work in history. You're not done in ruling this world. Come, Lord Jesus. Come close to these brothers and sisters. Remind us of the hope and love and joy that is yet to come. Amen.